Anyway, so this morning we're going to talk about a conceptual approach to survival analysis. So, handful of items. This is conceptual. When I first came to the NIH, I came into the NIH in 2002, and I started teaching this course in 2003. And they said, Laura Lee, we need you to teach time to event analysis. And every statistician I talked to said, you should not try to teach people such a complicated topic. And John Gallen and all of these clinicians came to me and said, this is in every single journal article we're reading. It is the main element in a lot of the data safety monitoring reports that we have to interpret. And Jerry's going to talk about that in a little bit after me. And actually, we're going to use the same example for one of our examples so you understand how to read it. And so the decision was made that we were going to teach about survival analysis, but we're going to teach about the concepts. So you understand what you're reading. And I'm also going to go into something called Cox models. So I will tell you that most introductory classes stop at Kaplan-Meier. The problem is that you can misinterpret a lot of information from there. It looks very clean and simple, but you can make mistakes. So I went against all my biostatistician's advice and now teach you actually a slightly more complicated type of survival analysis, but it is one of the most commonly used ones. So if you are reading the literature, you need to understand when to use one, when to use the other, and the problems that can come up. So a lot of this is not that you can run your own survival analysis, it's so you can try to interpret the information and understand the assumptions so when you're reading the articles, you can decide do those assumptions make sense. So a large part is I want you all to be able to question the supposed evidence that is in front of you. So this is the joint example that I have with Jerry, and hopefully he will go through a lot more of the details here. You know, Beatrice talked about a mother-infant transmission study yesterday. This was actually the first of those studies that went out. So this was a study of zidovudine. Some people know it as AZT. And this example actually is from my friend, Dennis O'Dixon, who's now retired from NIAID. There was a large study that was initiated in 1991. It was funded both by the National Institutes of Health in the United States and the National Agency of Research on AIDS in France. And what they knew at this point in time, the late 80s and early 90s as they were starting the study, was that zidovudine could slow the progression of HIV in adults with advanced disease. And so the AIDS Clinical Trials Group Protocol 076 was started, but it was designed to assess safety and efficacy of zidovudine and preventing transmission of HIV from infected but not advanced women to their babies. So what's our problem here? We tend to not want to actually deliver interventions to pregnant women because we're afraid we're going to harm the fetus. But here's a case, I need to do a randomized study because the fetuses are being harmed. These babies are being born at that point in time. 30% of them were developing HIV within the next 18 months after birth. So what I'm trying to do is slow that transmission. But, you know, if I give zidovudine and now 50% of the infants are born, or maybe, in fact, there's a miscarriage, but let's say 50% of the infants are born and they die within a year, perhaps that is a worse outcome. So you don't know what's going to happen. The other part is at that point in time, zidovudine only given to people that have advanced disease. Now I'm saying I'm giving it to every woman. Advanced, early, I don't care. You're getting zidovudine. So this study was powered at 80%, and we'll talk about how you kind of change these sample size calculations when you're dealing with survival analysis. And I should also add here, survival is a little bit of a misnomer because it's really time to event. It's just that many times we use that event as death, 
but it really can be any event. And in this case, the event was transmission, so it was actually having three seropositive test results in the infant. Although that depends on kind of when you are looking at HIV research, how you would define that. So it was powered at 80% to detect a 33% transmission reduction through 78 weeks of baby's life. So that was relative to this projected rate of 30%. Pro tip, whenever you have a projected rate of an event, that event will happen at a much lower rate when you start your study. The healthiest thing you can do for yourself is enroll in a clinical trial. It sometimes seems. Anyway, so I have a target sample size, all things considered, of 748 women and then their accompanying babies. So 748 women I need to enroll in this study. We begin enrollment April of 1991, or my friend did, and the projected accrual was that it was going to take at least five years to get 748 women into this study, and then I need to follow them through their entire pregnancy and 78 weeks of the infant life. And we are anticipating 15% dropouts. So what does this dropout mean? I'm anticipating that some of these women are gonna miscarry, some of them are gonna move and I'm not gonna be able to track them down. And we'll talk about how you can use some of the data, but not necessarily all of it. But then also I knew that some of these assays could go missing. Like it might be that in fact I didn't know because they did the blood test, but I don't actually get the information. So the DSMB is set up at this study to meet twice a year to monitor the safety. Because remember, I wanna see are women having more miscarriages? Are they having other issues during delivery? What issues are happening to the fetus and then the baby and to mom? The efficacy review, so the DSMB is meeting to monitor the safety of everything else, but then they're gonna actually do an interim analysis of safety after each one third of the infant infections. So in survival or time to event analysis, Everything from the sample size to when you want to look at data is actually driven by the number of events, and then you back calculate to the number of people you need to have those events. But really, everything's driven by number of events. So our first efficacy review in this study took place February 1994, based on the mothers enrolled up to December of 1993 and their babies. So we had clean data from April 1991 to December 1993, and then some of the last minute data for, um, for the months between December 93 and the meeting. And this is what they saw. So you're in a meeting in February of 1994, and we see these curves. So what do we have here? So the probability of transmission is along my y-axis. What shows up here that's a little interesting? Well, typically in survival curves, at time zero, so this is the x-axis, and this is the weeks that the baby's been alive, right? Typically, everything zeroes out. But some of these children seroconverted before they were born from the way the testing was able to be done in the early 90s. So I've got one curve, this curve here on the bottom, for zidovudine. And then I've got another curve up top, and this is looking at the babies whose moms are on the placebo arm. Now remember at this time, these babies are nursing. The reason mom stays on zidovudine, because you don't want to give them formula. This was happening in several countries in Africa. There is no formula. They are all nursing. Now remember, I planned that my placebo rate of transmission was supposed to be 30%. I'm looking at 72, not 78 weeks, but at 72 weeks, I've got 25.5% transmission in my placebo group. But I've put the confidence interval on here. That confidence interval actually did include 30%, but it's pretty wide. Now, why is that? So underneath, if you have a good graph coming out, these are our Kaplan-Meier curves, I've got numbers, placebo and zidovity. So what this says is that at time zero, I have data on 183 babies in the placebo arm and 180 babies in zidovudine. At 24 weeks, my data is based on 84 babies in placebo and 105 in zidovudine. 
Why is this? Well, this means that between zero and 24 weeks, either mom and baby, so I might have censoring of the baby. So let's say baby just got onto this trial. You know, I don't have 24 weeks of data yet because the baby was born three months ago. They would be censored in between here and here. It might be that they had an event in those first six months of life. That's also the reason. So about 100, so 99 of these babies either got censored or had an event between six and 24 weeks. I mean, zero and 24 weeks. So we plot along. So when I'm looking at this 72-week data, I'm looking at this 25% versus 8.3%. It's based on data, that absolute data, from 37 babies in a placebo arm and 43 babies in the zidovudine arm that I'm still collecting data on at this point. However, all the data from all the other babies get used as long as I can get their data. And we'll talk more about that during this morning. So this is what we see. We look at this data. Remember, we were expecting the rate in the in, that we were going to drop from 30% to an absolute rate of 20% transmission. So we were expecting that rate in absolute transmission. It was going to drop one-third, so from 30% to 20% transmission. And instead, they see 8.3% transmission rate. There's a confidence interval around that, but those confidence intervals, they don't overlap. Now, what they did is they ran something called a log rank test. And they got a p-value of 0 0.00006. So Jerry's going to talk to you about how you compare these, but this blew way past the efficacy bound. And then the question is, do we stop the study early? Do we have enough information to actually make a decision? So Jerry will talk about that during his lecture and to help you understand, but I wanted you to understand the graph. And then Jerry will talk to you about how you try to make a decision with some of the information on this graph and a lot of other information too. So that last graph is Kaplan-Meier curves. And you have a little bit of an idea of what they're telling you. When you look at these Kaplan-Meier curves, whenever we deal with survival, it's important to remember this outcome is now basically three elements. The outcome variable is your event. That's going to be talked about on the y-axis. In this case, it's the mother-infant HIV transmission, although really what it is is baby testing positive. What is the time origin? Where is time zero? In this case, it was infant birth. What is the time scale? We're following babies, we're talking about weeks. So we're measuring more of a weekly basis. If I'm trying to follow someone with lung cancer, which takes decades, I'm following them for years. If I'm looking at them actually developing lung cancer. You also have to think about how is the time at which the event occurs defined. I don't constantly have a watch on their blood I'm not like, you know, drawing it every five minutes and, figure out, and now, bam, they have zero converted. Just like in cancer, you know, you look for cancer to come up, you look for cancer recurrence. I'm not sticking them in a scanner every day. It's saying I know the exact date they occurred. Instead, you find this out usually in something called intervals. But we're going to ignore that fact for now. It is something, however, that when you're really planning studies, you have to take into account. So this Kaplan-Meier method, this, actually these are two guys, Kaplan and Meyer. I meant to look it up again. I want to say the paper was a page and a half long that they wrote. So basically both of these gentlemen back in the 1940s, one was in engineering actually, they wrote similar papers and submitted them to the same journal. And the editors said, your methods are very similar, write the paper together. And, and do it. So it took them longer, but they actually did get it submitted. And it's one of the most cited papers actually in the statistical literature. Um, so this is one way to estimate survival, or in the case that I was just giving, transmission of HIV. It's nice, it's simple. You will now learn how to compute it by hand. However, 
even though you can add stratification factors, like I made one Kaplan-Meier curve for placebo and one for zidovudine, there's really no sensible interpretation for competing risks. Think about these infants. They could get diarrheal disease. They could die from a lot of other things before they ever seroconvert to HIV. How do you handle that in these analyses? Do you need to handle that in these analyses? And I will say, unless your outcome is death, you need to handle competing risks. And we'll talk more about that also. The reason we're going to talk about Cox modeling is because Kaplan-Meier does not handle covariates. And if you're going to stratify, you still have to have something I can categorize. And who knows if I'm going to make those category categories in a reasonable way. Kaplan-Meier, however, has been a workforce. It has been a workhorse for many, many decades. And it's simple, it's intuitive, and people like it. So I don't want you to come away from this thinking Kaplan-Meier is bad. I want you to realize that it's useful within a limited scope of what it's good for. So you need to know kind of when you should wear it, when you should not. My blue shirt is a beautiful shirt. I love my shirt. It was not useful for today's lecture. It's really that simple. So this is what you get at the first interim analysis. And Next lecture, we'll talk about what you actually do with that. So now on to the main event, survival or time to event analysis. So why survival? Why not something else? So you use survival, let's say you have a new cancer treatment. I want to know if this treatment is going to extend somebody's life five months longer than current treatment. Everything about survival is events and when they happen. Now, it can be death, that's your common one. And here, a lot of times, we'll also look at infections. I forgot to write out some of my letters on this one, sorry. Myocardial infarctions or heart attacks, hospitalizations. But it can also be recurrence of cancer after treatment. It can also be something that can happen many, many times. I can look at marriage. You may never get married. You could be married seven times. Lots of things that can happen there. Soccer goals, same thing. So you can have recurrent events that may, in fact, never occur. Light bulbs failing, computer crashes. In engineering, they actually talk about time to failure. It's the same types of analyses when you look at the math. And it doesn't even have to be time. My favorite example that we'll show a little bit of is actually balloons filling with air until it bursts. So we actually used a very similar design to test some condoms. So, why do you use survival analysis? Think about hypertension studies. So people always worry about high blood pressure, and they say, oh, but we're going to try to lower blood pressure. Well, really, what are you trying to do? You want to live a long and happy life. You don't particularly care what your blood pressure is. You're trying to not have heart disease. You're trying to be able to live and enjoy yourself. What's your actual question? You actually want to follow people long term because what you need to think about is, let's say I lower your blood pressure and I cut your lifespan by two years. Does that make you happy? Do you want to take my blood pressure medication? Well, if you only measure blood pressure and never measure how long they live, that could be what happens. And in fact, that's exactly the issue that came up in COX-2 inhibitors. They followed people short term with these drugs, and it was great because I have all these people, you know, they have osteoarthritis of the knee and all of these other issues, and now they have less pain, they're able to function better, they're doing more activity, this has to be good for them, right? Well, until about 18 months, and actually what also happened is they didn't pay attention, they did Cox models, they didn't pay attention that the proportional hazards were not proportional, and around 18 months, the actual hazard curves shifted, and they ended up crossing each other. And so we'll go through that example. Now, sometimes, and this is my own personal thing, people who have you know, a lower body weight, they eat more blueberries, whatever, they live longer. A lot of that data comes from observational studies. Now, Jerry on Monday didn't talk that much, although he did mention my favorite observational study, which is from Kathy Flagel at CDC. So the Center for Disease Control and Prevention had gotten a whole bunch of money to fight obesity. 
And so the testimony before Congress, all sorts of stuff. They did a model, they did a very simple model that said if you have a body mass index, they looked at underweight, normal weight, overweight, and different levels of obesity. They said if you are overweight or higher, this is tied to higher mortality. What is the number one variable you think might predict your time of death? Might be your age. In fact, actually, whenever you model age, it's usually age and age squared. They left age out of the model of mortality. Don't do that. So a couple of investigators at CDC and two investigators from the NIH reanalyzed the NHANES data. Turns out that there's a lovely curve. BMI of 28 is exactly where they want to be. I'm like, oh, that makes me very happy. This is why it's one of my favorite papers. So, but seriously, and in fact, actually, this went with all the mathematical modeling that had been done about BMI in the 1980s as it related to mortality. So you have to remember, though, let's say that somebody wanted to change their body weight. Let's say my body mass index is 30. If I move to 28, does that help me? Just purely looking at cross-sectional data doesn't necessarily mean that by instigating a change, you're going to see the same impact on folks. So it's really important to think and to actually do these long-term analyses following people over time to see if you get the same type of impacts. Now, other people tell me they can't do survival analysis because people just live too long. And I'm like, oh, we can only hope. Please, pretty please. I'd love my patients to live longer. It's great. Love the people in my trials. I had a trial in end of life studies. And um, everybody was, that entered the study, one of the criterion is they were supposed to die within the next six months. That was the expectation. And most of them lived for 18 plus months. And I said, well, we have to keep the study going. It's actually a good thing, right? There are a lot of surrogate variables. But sometimes you just have to follow people for a long period of time. So what about survival? Survival deals with event rates. It is the rate at some little time t among those people who are at risk of the event. Men are not at risk of being pregnant, so they are out of my sample. Look at the median survival, folks, not the mean survival. Because the mean, you have to actually have a measure on everybody. I have to know the time that everybody had an event. And remember, median, median when you talk about time to event, because not everybody's going to have an event. So you cannot calculate means except in extremely rare circumstances. So how do we do this? Remember that model I talked about the other day? Well, now we have a little bit of change. So we still have kind of this outcome, these coefficients and the covariates. But what we're also going to do is have this thing. This is called a lambda. This little symbol here is lambda. So this is our baseline hazard. And it's going to be across time t. So this is my hazard function. Lambda, my baseline hazard, an exponential. I still have my betas. I still have these regression coefficients. And I still have these x's. Now, in the survival literature, they tend to call these prognostic factors. Just think of them as covariates. Because in fact, it sounds causal, but it's not necessarily. So these are the elements. And I'm going to treat it really the exact same way I treated all those other models when I'm looking at the hypothesis testing. So some of the vocabulary we've been using. Survival is the same as time to event. Like really, we use them interchangeably. Outcome variables involve information about that event time. So remember, there are three elements to the outcome variable. There are lots of different types of events. It could be an HIV positive test, an AIDS defining event. It could be diagnosing Ebola. It could be lots of things. It could also be that it's the time and after which the systolic blood pressure cholesterol goes below some cut. So if we have time at the end, I'll go through an example of the MIST trial. So MIST was initially a trial. There are three different ways that they were looking at um, dealing with miscarriages. So one was just waiting, one was actually evacuation, and then one was a medication. So at first, they were mainly worried about gynecologic infection. So that was kind of a yes, no. Did they get it within a certain period of time? 
But as a secondary outcome, they followed these women because what they wanted to know is how they treated that index miscarriage, did that impact their ability to have a live birth later? So you want to actually look at time to live birth. But there are a lot of other factors that go into that. So how do we think about time? Time, we use this lowercase t, the little t, for the time axis. And when we set it equal to zero, that is your time origin. I know I need to slow down. I'm sorry. I, get, I love survival analysis. I get very excited. So the capital T, the big T, is the random outcome variable. And that is the time at which the event occurs. So little t is going to march along that x-axis, but capital T is what you're going to measure. It's the time that the event occurs. So little t, I might have, you know, baseline, then follow people for 6, 12, 18, 24 months. And I'm going to try to measure survival at different time points. And the way that a statistician thinks about this is I want to measure the probability the time of the event is greater than that little time t. So what is the probability the time of the event is greater than zero months, six months, 18 months, 24 months? Sometimes I do one minus that probability. Everything I talk about, and you'll even see my graphs, they flip-flop on this. And Beatrice showed you one of those Kaplan-Meier curves yesterday. She's talked about that a little bit. So you have to define your outcome variable. You define your time. Now we need to define outcome. What is the event? Are you measuring death, marriages? What are you going to measure? What is the time origin? Sometimes it's time of diagnosis. There are lots of time origins, not just birth. And what is the time scale? What makes sense as a metric of measurement to think about time? You need to know what time the event occurs, and you need to think if you're going to use covariates or not, and how you're going to measure them. Could you do logistic regression? I always get this question. More than half of you knew what logistic regression is, so I'm cutting it off at the pass, as they like to say. Logistic regression is a yes-no outcome. It's binary. So I could say, you know, what's the probability of mother, infant, um, HIV transmission by 72 weeks. That is a yes, no. But remember Paul's graph yesterday. Maybe they're all going to have an event occur, but one of them has it occur much earlier than the other. We may like to know that. So that's the reason we use survival analysis. You know, if I say everybody has a recurrence of cancer by five years, but, you know, in one drug, they all have had a recurrence within 18 months, and the other drug, it's four and a half years. I probably want to be on the drug with the four and a half years, right? So what's this choice of time scale? Study time, when we're thinking about clinical trials, the origin is usually time of diagnosis or time that you start a new treatment. So, you know, time of randomization, we usually start the clock when we start changing that intervention of some sort. Sometimes in occupational epidemiology, for instance, it might be time of first exposure. So we'll have a nickel refinery example that will show you one for that. A lot of times in epidemiology, we're following people across a lifespan, so we may start at birth. There are a lot of different origins you can use, but you must define it. So here are a few more examples. So treatment of cancer, the event is death, let's say. Time origin is date of surgery or date of resection of the tumor. The time scale was in months, and the time that we were measuring was time from surgical treatment to death. So this was a pancreatic cancer study of adenocarcinoma of the pancreas. So here I'm going to graph this probability of survival versus time. So everybody started off alive. They had to go into surgery alive. I got that. Then they're going to go down over time. Now, this is what's called a monotonically decreasing curve. Why? Because once you're dead, you're done. You do not come back to life in my studies. Like, you may come back to life back and forth on the table, but not by the time you're in my data set. So this may stay flat for a while, like it does right up here, or it may go down until at nine months post-surgery, I've got about 25% of people who are still alive. 
This is a highly lethal disease. So your statistician will tell you S of 9 equals P, the probability of T is greater than or equal to 9, and that's 0.25. And then they start to walk away, and you're like, wait, what, what did you just say? 25% is the probability that time from surgical treatment to death is greater than nine months. Don't understand that really either. If you're an oncologist and I say to you, nine month post resection survival is 25%, you understand that. If I'm talking to my father, I say, you know, your nine month survival after surgery is 25%. Because if you tell them your nine, the, chance that you're dead in nine months is 75%. They don't like that, although it's also a true statement here. Luckily, things have gotten slightly, slightly better in pancreatic cancer. So survival is always bounded by zero and one. At some point, everybody is event free, and at some point, we are all going to die. That is the assumption that we make. So. We do talk about it sometimes as time to having the event and sometimes one minus that time. So sometimes you start at zero and go up and sometimes you start at one and go down. But the idea is you wanna think about the proportion of the population still without the event or with the event at some point in time. More survival function descriptions. Again, if I'm talking about death and I'm measuring it in months, I might say that my five-year survival probability is 30% because I have 60 months. T is equal to 60, but it's measured in months. Outside of, you know, small little research group, they tend to think in years. Or I could say 70% of patients die within the first five years. Now, even though it's not necessarily true, you know, for marriage and other things like that, the idea is that if I waited long enough, I watched long enough, everybody would have the event. That is an assumption, but it's not a very strong assumption. So what about the underlying things here? Really, all right, there's something called martingales. We're not going near that. We're gonna talk about hazard functions. Hazard functions are this incidence rate. It's the instantaneous risk, or my favorite definition, force of mortality. I love the Europeans. They call this the force of mortality. It's great but really instantaneous risk or this incidence rate. If you look in the textbooks, they'll call it lambda of t or h of t. And the idea is what is the event rate in that little segment of time you wanna measure among everybody at risk for the event? This is the key function that underlies all a survival analysis. It's estimated in a very straightforward way if you have censoring or truncation. And now, in a few minutes, we'll talk about what those two words actually mean. So what do I mean when I talk about the hazard function? Nobody really talks about the hazard function, but actually we think about it. And I think this is gonna come up more and more so in our next few, next few months as we're looking at these various infectious diseases around. Let's say our event is death. We go back to this month scale. The second bullet is what I see in statistics land. The third bullet, at one year, so at 12 months, patients are dying at a rate of 1% per month. So at one year, the chance of dying in the following month, so you make it, if you make it to one year, the chance you're gonna die in the next month is 1%. You gotta make it to one year first though. Now the question next is what is instantaneous? You've got to define what that unit of time is. And that's really good. So people in the news, I'm sure they do it here from what I could understand from some of the talks. You know, you try to decide if you make it sound really bad or not so bad. A lot of times in survival analysis you do that by thinking about changing that little element of time. 120,000 people die in one year. I could also just as easily say 10,000 die in a month, 357 die in a day. I could tell you how many die every five minutes if I wanted to. 
What is your element of time? It really, really matters when you are defining and performing your survival analyses. Herpes. Locked people in a room because of this study. Recurrence of herpes lesions after treatment for the primary episode. How do you define recurrence for herpes? How do you figure out the end of the primary episode? Not just that a bunch of docs can figure out the end of a primary episode, but so that the participants on the trial who are at home can tell us they are at the end of the primary episode and we can document it. Because you had to be really careful that it wasn't kind of a continuation of the primary episode, or was it episode ended, this is new episode. Thus, we got locked in a room so nobody could go to the bathroom until we figured out what our definitions were. Um, anyway, you have to define this really well, and you have to define it in a way so that one, other people believe you, and two, everybody's going to make the same decision about this. Our time origin was end of the primary episode. The time scale was months from the end of the primary episode until they actually had their recurrence. The time from the end of the primary episode to the first recurrence is what I'm really trying to get at measuring, but it has all these elements. This is a classic example from Leon Gordas on the toxin effect in lung cancer risk. So there was a nickel finery study. This happened like back in the 1930s, old, old study. People who worked at the nickel refinery were considered to be exposed. Now, honestly, some of them were not exposed. Some of them worked in the bookkeeping and never went out into the refinery. But occupational exposure, the event was death from lung cancer. It takes a very long time to develop lung cancer. So the origin, they had great employment records. So they said the day you started working at the refinery is the day we consider that you started your exposure. Is it perfect? No, but it's actually a, it's a reasonable way to try to do the study. The scale was years since that first exposure, so years since they started their first employment at the nickel refinery, because some people were employed, went away, were employed again, so they said, first day of employment, first time you were employed. And the time we were measuring was from time of first employment to death from lung cancer. Population mortality. We see this, all of our different countries create these types of data. Event is death, time origin is date of birth, time scale is age in years, and you're trying to look at age of death. So when you try to see when people are dying, and usually they break it out by men and by women, stuff like that. One of my favorite examples, because it's different, if you haven't figured that out yet, volume of air the balloon can tolerate. So this is one where the time scale is not time, actually. The event was the balloon bursting. What we're actually measuring are the milliliters of air that were infused in this vacuum area into the balloon. And the origin is zero milliliters of air. All right, wake up. Everybody poke the person next to them, because I see some eyes floating down. And then the milliliters of air in the balloon when it bursts. So there's a lot of stuff that can happen here. What are some of the unique features of survival analysis? The event is involved. Some event has to happen. You have to define that event. You have some progression on a dimension, usually time until that event occurs. The length of that progression may vary among your subjects. And the event may not even happen for some subjects, especially over study. People may not die when they're on your study. That's a good thing in some ways. Sample size considerations. The event, because it may never happen, sample sizes are based on the number of events. Then I calculate backwards to figure out the number of subjects. If my event rate is lower than I expected, I may need to start thinking about adding more subjects to my study. So this is another part of the type of information that you are looking at, as those DSMBs are considering all the issues that could come up in a trial. Covariates may need to be considered, age, total exposure, et cetera. All of this may need to go into those sample size considerations. So let's talk a little bit about truncation and censoring. Truncation is entering a study, and censoring is leaving the study. Now, I mention this because most classes never, ever talk about truncation. 
But I was trained by some very good epidemiologists in addition to biostatisticians, and truncation is incredibly important in epidemiology and should be remembered when you're dealing even with randomized trials. So there are two types of truncation, right and left. Right truncation is, let's say you're using registry data. Say you're using a cancer registry. You only are sampling people who have that event of interest. You may be missing people who either never had their cancer diagnosed or never ended up in that cancer registry. So you, in fact, using that registry data, will probably have an underestimate of the survival. Left truncation is because short survival may be overlooked. Let's say you only look at people who are over 65 in your study. Anybody who died younger isn't in your study or had the event younger. So you have an overestimate with left truncation. So sometimes you have these delayed things. We'll talk a little bit more about that and some of the issues on the next slide. Censoring is leaving the study. Everybody will talk about right censoring. Every method of survival analysis handles incomplete follow-up. It's common, right censoring, everything handles that. Left censoring is when the observed time and the survival time, the observed time is actually greater than this. And so I will talk about this just a little bit in an example. But the key element for truncation and censoring is they need to be independent. And you're going to hear me discuss this on about 20 different slides coming up, because it's that important. So left truncation. The reason that people that are doing randomized trials don't worry about this as much and other studies is in medical sciences, we tend to zero things out at the time of diagnosis or time of treatment. But a key assumption for this is that anybody entering the study at some time T is a random sample of people in the population still at risk at time T. So again, just like this idea that if you do not sample well, you're going to have biased estimates. Same thing holds here in survival analysis. This idea is that you want to be able to actually estimate that hazard function in a valid way. So can you really generalize? Censoring. Again, incomplete observations. To the right, easy to follow up with. If the event occurred before you ever started following them, before that time origin, and you don't know the exact time, that, that is more difficult. So an example of left censoring. Let's say that you're looking at smoking. So you want to figure out the age that kids start smoking. You interview a bunch of 12-year-olds, and some 12-year-old says, yeah, I smoke. And that kid doesn't remember when he or she started smoking. That's an example of left censoring. A more common one that we came up with in one of my studies was a cytomegalovirus infection. So two subjects come into the study, they're already infected at the time of enrollment. So how do I figure out at what point in time they became infected? Now, many people will say, really, what you need to do is start your study with a younger set of people then. You need to start with younger kids. Your inclusion-exclusion criteria need to be more precise. But you have to think about what types of generalizations do you want to make, and how will that change your study design and your analysis? It's not common to have to deal with truncation or left censoring, but it does happen. So it's something to think about as you're planning your studies. One form of right censoring, the main form, I'll go back to that, is withdrawals. The idea is that you want people who are leaving your study, you want the event of their leaving unrelated to the risk of having the event you're trying to measure. This is what independent censoring is. Accidental death is usually okay. If somebody moves out of the area, people tend to think that's okay too, but a lot of times people are moving for some last miracle cure. So in fact, it may not be independent. 
This is a picture of right censoring. So this is from one of my studies where we were enrolling babies from age zero to six months, and then we're following them up to two years. So these are just 10 patients. The open circles, like this one right here, that's a censored event. A solid circle, I'm sorry, I shouldn't use the word event, that's censoring. So this is a censored patient. This patient, or sorry, this study participant had an event. So when you look at these graphs, sometimes you see a solid circle, it's an event, an open circle is censoring. So I just line them up as to when we put them in the study. So these two participants, they were censored partway through the study. What actually happened is that those folks up there got enrolled early in the study. We followed them all the way to the end. They had not had the event by 24 months. And so we said, okay, no event by 24 months. You're now done. We're not following you anymore. At the end of the study, so we had no more money, end of the study, these two patients, these two participants, rather, had already not had an event, but we had to terminate their behavior in the study because we had to stop the study. So that's the reason they were censored. But they had not had an event yet. They all contributed that information, though, to the analysis. So sometimes I censor because I'm going to follow everybody for the exact same period of time. My goal is to follow everyone, for example, for 24 months. Sometimes, or a year. Sometimes I'm going to stop after I have a certain number of events. You see that in engineering, not so much in medicine. What you see in medicine is a combination of the two this kind of random censorship, and it is more like type one censorship, where the idea many times is that we say we want to follow everybody for kind of this minimum amount of time, but maybe up to a maximum amount of time. So we may follow, like, at the end of four years, I'm turning off my study. Some people may get followed for one year, some people may get followed for four years, but it's going to be variable. There are analysis methods to handle all of this. Your general notation, that capital T, that big T, is the event time. Then you have their observation time. So if the event occurs, you have an observation time. Otherwise, what you have is follow-up time, right? You followed them, but nothing happened. This is a tricky point that comes up next, because depending on the software you use, you will either need to put into your model a failure indicator, so they had the event, or a sensor indicator. These are the exact opposite of each other. Read what the program actually means for you to put in. So in one of my statistical software, I put in failure indicators. So if they had the event, I say their observation time equals this event time, and they have a one. Over here, it means that I sense, so, or they did not have the event, they get a zero. So my observation time is less. So failed or not, but I flip it if it's censoring. So you have to think and look and read your documentation. But there's gonna be some indicator, did they have the event or not? It's just how you code it that may vary. Independent censoring. Everybody at risk at a given time point in the study, that little t, is a random sample of the population who could be at risk at that time point across all time points. That assumption is how you actually get an unbiased estimate of your hazard function. So if you have covariates, so somebody asks, what if you have differential dropout? We have a way to handle that in survival analysis in many ways, because as long as censoring is independent within group, it can be independent based on some covariate in my model. Again, why I love Cox models. As long as censoring, censoring can depend on some covariate, it just has to be independent given that covariate. Because that's how you handle the fact that a lot of people in one arm may be having events, and not in the other arm. A lot of people may drop out in one arm versus the other arm. If you have time to event analysis, to a certain extent, you can handle that. You have 50% of your people drop out and you lose touch with them, 
you're missing a lot of data and you're going to have bias in other ways, regardless of whether the model will work, more or less. So some censoring examples. You know, the easy one I already discussed, you're at five years, some of your patients have not died or had their event of interest. Have the school smoking study. They're following people from age five. They don't start smoking that early usually, at least in most countries, until age 25. The students are asked when they start smoking if they always say they never smoked. Well then, that is in fact an example of right censoring. Early in a trial, older subjects were not enrolled. The amount of time they could be on the study then is different than for those younger subjects. This is a problem. As long as I put age in the model, well, first, I have to know I have the problem. But if I put age in the model, I can still get appropriate estimates. If I don't condition on age, my estimates are going to be biased, and we'll go through an example of that. So remember, time origin might be enrollment or when the treatment begins. Your time axis is the time they're on the study. Right censoring is common. This is what you see in a clinical study, typically. Epidemiology studies, time axis might be the age, right censoring is common, left truncation is common. Bottom line, we have standard methods to deal with right censoring and left truncation. We will make it work, folks. It'll be all OK. Key assumption for, I think, now the fourth time, those at risk have to be a random sample of the population of interest in order to be able to make the inference in a non-biased way. So if you're enrolling those sick patients later, you have a problem. Survival analysis models mostly for the hazard function. It will accommodate incomplete observation of the times of the events. It also will accommodate censoring. So you basically, you're going to follow everybody, and they're right censored. If that last time you look at them, that last time of follow-up, they have not had the event. Typical intervention trials. We accrue into the study for two years. We do data analysis at year three. Reasons people have exited this study, they may have died. They may be alive at the end of the study, so I'm censoring them. They may withdraw from the study for non-study related reasons. Sometimes you'll see text that'll say, lost to follow-up, LTFU, all right? So there are other reasons that people may not be in the study, and that's where we go next. Competing risks, my dears. I like competing risks, and we were gonna have a fun example about competing risks. So competing risks, you got multiple reasons these people could fail and that they could die. Multiple considerations. If I'm looking at cancer diagnosis and you die from myocardial infarction, that's a competing risk. Why did this matter? So we have this great drug. It's actually called Dancing with the Red Devil by the ladies on the wards that get it. This drug actually causes and destroys your heart muscle. So while I'm curing your breast cancer, I'm leading you into heart failure. It's typically used in women who are in their 30s and 40s because they have a very aggressive form of breast cancer. Most of those women, I don't think, are really thrilled that I can cure their cancer by killing their heart. This is a competing risk. How do you handle this? If all I look at is time to cancer death, time to cancer recurrence, I'm going to miss this other awful thing that's happening to them. Now, I do think it's worthwhile to let the women know kind of what are your options. But there is really no basis for believing the independent assumption. Somebody can say, well, you censor them. They have left the study for reasons other than the events you cared about. Except I probably have they're tied together, so I can't believe that I have independence here. So, what is the diet? What, how do we want to interpret this? Statistics 
should make sense. As Jerry was talking to us over breakfast this morning, he's like, well, this is my common sense definition for this thing. And we're like, that's exactly how you should say it. Forget the math. Say it this way. Because the problem is, I don't want to interpret this hazard ratio, or this hazard rather, as the risk of cancer at some time t when the risk of death from myocardial infarction doesn't exist. That's not meaningful. I walk through life, lots of things could do stuff to me. I want to interpret my hazard as the risk of cancer among those people who are at risk of cancer. And if you had a myocardial infarction, I want to include you because if you're dead, you can't get cancer. But I need to think about this and I want it to be all okay. I want to be able to tell their doctors and their nurses and all their providers and the families the truth so they can make an educated decision. And the regulators can make an educated decision. So my friend Craig Borkoff is actually the Center for Disease Control and Prevention in the US. And he's from a town called Milwaukee, which is on this very, very cold lake called Lake Michigan. So remember, we're up north. And on the 1st of January, it's about negative 9 Celsius. And this group of people every year for several decades do something called a polar bear plunge. So they all go running into this freezing cold water in their bathing suits and play in the water and come back. I grew up where it's very hot and I think they are crazy. But people do this all over the world. Yes, yeah, some people are nodding their heads. You know what I'm talking about. So this is all fake data, but we came up with this example a few years ago because it's easier and more fun than trying to talk about smoking and heart disease. So anyway, we've got this group of 200 folks, and they go and polar bear plunge together every year. 3% of them are going to die. This is not real. Most people do not die doing this. 3% of them die taking their dip in Lake Michigan on the 1st of January. Along the way, in this group of 200 buddies and friends, 2% of the males die of other causes, and 1% of the females die of other causes. So when I follow them over 10, over 10 years, over a decade, what is the news report, folks? 25% of women die from taking the dip in Lake Michigan, but only 24% of men die. Why does this kill more women? You know, big news story. Women should not be allowed in the polar bear plunge. You know, they're dying at higher rates. Why does it harm women? Well, there are more women to harm, that's why. Because over that decade, 33.5% of the women have died from other causes. But 40% of the men died from other causes. This is why competing risks lead to misinterpretation of data. Over this decade, there are more women who can be harmed by the plunge, and therefore, if you simply look at death from polar bear plunge, again, made up, but if you simply look at that death, then you're getting the wrong story. Because we're all going to die of something. The trick is trying to figure out what. If you die of one thing, you cannot die of something else. It doesn't work that way, usually. Yeah, so the doctors are like, well, anyway, you know, you get the point. Got it. All right. So bottom line, you want to make inference about this hazard, this event rate among the subjects who are under observation at the time you are observing them. And I want to interpret it in a reasonable manner. So hypothesis testing, it all circles back to hypothesis testing. What do we say about this Kaplan-Meier? I already showed you this slide. But remember, it's simple. It's the simple way of doing this, but I can't handle those, those competing risks. Competing risks are not handled by Kaplan-Meier. So when I'm looking time to something, if it's time to death, no modifiers, not time to death by polar bear plunge, just time to death, you're probably, you might be OK, but there could be other reasons you are not OK. But it's simple. So simple, I am going to teach you how to do it right here. Okay, so this little S with a hat is our estimated survival. Actually, I better take my pointer just in case. Okay. 
So we're going to start off at time zero. Remember, I said at time zero, everybody is at risk. I'll have 20 people. Nobody's had an event. Survival probability is one. Five months in, 20 people have been at risk. Two of them have an event. This probability is one minus the number of people having the event divided by the total number at risk. Because remember, it's two of the 20 people multiplied by my previous survival. So now my survival at time five is 0.9, 90%. Let's look at six months. Well, I had those two people had events. If you're dealing with recurrent event survival, which we're not talking about, then you do this differently. But for just basic, plain event, time to event analysis, we do it this way. We subtract those two from the 20. I've got nobody censored yet, so I have 18 people at risk. No events since month five. So when I calculate this, I have one minus zero events divided by 18 people at risk multiplied by my previous survival. I'm still sitting at 0.9. Remember that early graph and there was like a straight line across in the Kaplan-Meier? This is what you're looking at. So it's going to stay flat until having events again. You may see little ticks. So why does this go from 18 to 15? Because I had three people who were censored between month six and month 10. So I have three people that are censored here. I'm down to 15 people at risk at month 10. One event happens at month 10, so this will be one minus. This is where that censoring, those three people that dropped out, they stayed in until now, but now I'm down to one over 15. And I've got times my previous survival of 90%. I'm down to 0.84. At 13 months, again, since I had that event, I'm down to 14 people at risk. Two more events occur. I'm 1 minus 2 over 14 times 0.84 equals a survival probability at 13 months of 72%. That's kind of the simplistic way of dealing with Kaplan Myers. Here's the picture. So on my picture, this fat white line is the Kaplan Meyer curve. These dashed lines are actually 95% confidence intervals or bands around this curve. There are a lot of different ways to actually create 95% confidence intervals and bands on these curves. They're described in the textbook. Don't worry about it. Well, do worry about it if you're trying to interpret graphs. Don't worry about it here because all of them have problems. But I just wanted you to know you can do it. So what is this Kaplan-Meier estimator? It is one estimate of the survival. We're going to use the same ideas when you're doing one minus the survival. You need independent censoring. So if I have high risk subjects entering my study late, that Kaplan-Meier curve, this curve is going to go down faster than it should because I'm only going to have early information on them. So this is going to drop faster than I actually wanted it to or than it should in truth. Censored observations provide information while they're on study. This is nice. You get as much data as you can. You use all of the data that you get. And if you ever see little hash marks, that's the time that people were censored. A lot of models, Kaplan-Meier is your only outcome. You might have different curves for the different interventions. You might stratify on gender. There are a lot of different ways to do this. How do you test? There's a very simple test. There are actually several. We're going to start with the first one. This is our null hypothesis, a survival at some time t equals in one group equals the survival in another group at some time t. Remember I said all test statistics really look alike? Yes, they do. So here is my estimate of survival in group one at a given time point and at group two, and I divide it by some function of the variance. This is the problem, though, is that people say, OK, we're going to test survival at five years, let's say. You choose some arbitrary time point, but it's a fixed point in time. And how do you know you had the correct one? So um, I, meant, I had one of John Powers' slides up yesterday. And he actually has a great example from antibiotics, where they actually looked at 10 days after starting the drug to see if the infection had cleared. The problem was one drug cleared infection in three days and one drug cleared infection at eight days. But when you ran this test, 
only at 10 days, you don't see a difference. It's similar to that picture that Paul had. He said, you know, this is just a fake example, but that's a very real example for infection. It's clinically important they cleared the infection five days earlier, typically. So for simple inference, what we tend to want to do is actually look across the entire time period. And that's why people use these log rank statistics. But when you look at any of these simple inference methods, you cannot take into account time-dependent covariates. So what's a time-dependent covariate? Let's say income is changing, marital status is changing, their blood pressure, their weight is changing over the period of time. Elements that you think might be impacting the results, if you can keep measuring them over time and putting them in, that may be useful for what you want to study. It's not easy to do it, but it's nice to have your options. But in log rank, you cannot do that. But what log rank does do is it looks across the entire survival experience. So that's why we put these little dots. So instead of a T, we put a dot. And that dot is saying across all time. Two independent samples, must be two, not three usually, two independent samples from the same population. The observed number of events is compared to the expected number of events. It's a very simple element. There is software to run it. The statistician should check it because some versions of log rank put more weight on early events. Some versions of log rank put weight on later events. Some of them, it's even across the whole time period. But the problem is confounding and that you only ever see a p-value. So somebody asked a question about minimization and why EMA said this for pediatrics. Well, that's because sometimes governmental agencies have conflicting guidance. But minimization came up actually fairly early on in the 1970s, it was used because the log rank test, if you have imbalance in those prognostic factors, so if you're in cancer and you have differing grades, stage, they've been on different drugs, stuff like that, those imbalances actually will bias the log rank test. So imbalances and baseline variables can lead to the wrong answer with a log rank test. So all of these cancer researchers they said, well, we have to figure out how to balance all of these variables. It's too hard to stratify. We'll use minimization. Now, this was probably not on, I have no idea how, at the time, EMEA decided to set their guidance. But it wouldn't surprise me, in pediatric oncology, almost every single kid that has cancer is on a study. That's how they get treatment in many countries. So it wouldn't surprise me that those folks are really thinking about minimization because that's a big deal in pediatrics, is dealing with pediatric oncology. But, you know, the people dealing with just general medicine, they're not really all that worried about it. Plus, we have other ways of handling it now. So anyway, stratified log rank, then we're comparing the survival within each stratum. But again, you get to this problem that when you start looking at smaller and smaller groups, you have less and less power, maybe not enough people inside each stratum to make a decision. You, again, also, it's just a significance test. It's just a p-value. But then you try to add in curves. You try to do other information. But it can be messy. But that's how they got here. That p-value is a log rank test. Major decisions were made worldwide based on that graph. So Cox models. Cox models, we have our model here. It's the same idea of hypothesis testing. The idea is that if my beta equals zero, that a coefficient is zero, my hazard ratio is one. That means the two groups have the same survival experience. But what I'm actually going to look at is the relative rate. The relative risk over time is a way to think about it. That's the exponential of that beta. Why do I like Cox? You can add covariates to the model. I could stratify, but I don't need to stratify. When you're interpreting a Cox model and it's proportional, then the change in the prognostic factor, the change in that x, is going to lead to a proportional change in the hazard on something called the log scale. 
Just remember, it's not additive, it's proportional. Everything here multiplies. Statistical software will do everything. You will not solve this by hand, nor will I. And you can test the effect of the prognostic factor just like linear regression. That null hypothesis is again beta equals zero. This gives us the framework for making inference about the covariate effects. This is what's called, for the handful of statisticians in the room, a semi-parametric model because we do not specify the baseline hazard. Nobody else in this room cares about that fact, but just we have like four statisticians here, now you know. This is a multiplicative model. So again, the effect of the covariate, if I move from drug to no drug, if I move from age 50 to age 60, the effect of that covariate is going to multiply the rate by some factor. You got two main types of Cox models. You are either going to have a constant relative rate over time, that's proportional hazards, or you have to model that relative rate over time. You are going to allow time-dependent covariates and stratification factors when you do Cox modeling. So my age example. Early on in the trial, older subjects weren't enrolled in one of my studies. So, you know, they had an age limit of 60. Eventually, they raised that to 70. If age isn't taken into account with the Kaplan-Meier, so if I don't stratify my Kaplan-Meiers on this, the Kaplan-Meier estimate is biased because the censoring is not independent. Censoring later on is due to age. As long as I put age in my Cox model, I'm okay. So I had a student once who, uh, yeah, I, I taught this for about three or four years, and somebody said, well, why don't I just follow everybody for one year? Aren't I okay? Now I've got the same amount of information on everybody. And I said, well, not necessarily, because your study in general is still not proportional by age to your population risk set. And so this very smart person says, well, can't I just oversample the older folks late and then I can make up for it and I can have a correct proportional part? And I said, well, you could, or you could just put age in the model and be done with it as long as you have enough older people in your study, you know, to make inference. Like, if you have one older person, not going to help you so much. But I was like, you could go to a lot of work or you could put age in the model. Like, I, I cannot work a lot of miracles, but there are a handful of things I can do kind of easily. Testing proportional hazards. This is why you had to learn about the interactions yesterday. So we have our base model in the first bullet. I have age and I have the drug that they were going to get. The second bullet is part of that model. What I've done is I've added in age, times the natural log, which is the LN of time. And I also have drug times the natural log of time. And I'm doing this to see if I actually have proportional hazards. There are three things you have to look at to determine this issue of proportional hazards. Number one is something called a wall test. That's the p-value. And so we're going to look at these on the next slide. So the p-values associated with beta 3 and beta 4. So I'm going to look at the, what, what is this beta test and what is the hypothesis test on that other beta. Then I'm going to do something called a partial likelihood test. And what that does is it says for the overall model, by adding in these two other elements to this big model, is that really overall a better model than this first simple one? I do that with something called partial likelihood ratio tests. And then I also look at some residual plots, which I am not going to have us look at. So my first study example, drug and age. So this is the simple model up top. The printout says coef, so that would be my beta or my coefficient, is 0.58 for drug. There's a standard error on that. There's a p-value of 0.2 and a 95% confidence interval. Down here is where I have my bigger model. And I want to look at the drug time interaction. These p-values, so this is where I do that quote-unquote walled test, 
I look at these p-values, they're not significant. They're nowhere close to significant anyone's imagination. Confidence interval, same way. When I compare models, this lower model and the top model, partial likelihood ratio tests, there's something called two degrees of freedom because I added two new variable things in there. Those two interaction terms, the p-value is 0.94. I, I can assume proportional hazards. I'm going to assume proportional hazards here. This example, I didn't get to assume proportional hazards. Why? Because the p-value for this drug time interaction is 0 0.001. And when I compared the two models to each other, the overall p-value for this partial likelihood ratio test was 0 0.003. You do not need to know the details of this. What you need to know is sometimes the hazards are not proportional. So if somebody says in their paper they used Cox proportional hazards, you need to make sure it also says in the paper that they tested to see if they met the proportional hazards assumption. There are three ways they could talk about doing that. They just, you need to know that they tested that they could use it. And if they couldn't use it, they need to be using the bigger model. They need to be interpreting things with time involved. If not, you end up on the front page of the news with COX-2 inhibitors. Time-dependent survival curves. I'm not going to go into this, but a lot of times there's this failure to account to changes in exposures or treatments over time. Do not make that mistake. There's a classic example, actually, at the Stanford Heart Transplant Study. So this is when we started doing heart transplants in the US. They published the paper. The problem is it was non-randomized, but they have this time before transplant and the time post-transplant. So when you look at time to death and like, did they transplant, yes, no, it's actually how that time got broken up before and after transplant that really drove the information. So think about it, you know, think about your antiretroviral therapies. You're constantly changing the drugs. You want to be able to take that into account when you're actually trying to look at people over time. So your take home message here, before we go into our examples, choose the right method and choose the right test. You know, if you get nothing else from this class, get the ethics and get that. Kaplan-Meier is simple, log rank tests are also useful, but these are potentially misleading. Cox proportional hazards is our new workhorse, born in the 1970s, it's very new. Not everything is proportional you need to check, and you need to consider using the general non-proportional Cox models. And if you have recurrent events, you need to check on that. Changes in protocol matters and time matters. You must keep your statistician engaged in your study, your data managers engaged in your study at all times, from the planning through the end. Because if I didn't know that they were not recruiting some of those older folks, then we would have had the wrong analysis. So, examples. Series of prospective cohort and randomized studies went on looking at survival of patients with liver cirrhosis. This was going on in the 1980s, 1990s. I like to talk about old studies because they get me in less trouble. But sometimes I talk about new ones. So this one, I'm comparing this new treatment with placebo. There are all these conflicting reports in the literature. And this one study gets published. They say we've got two-year survival probability of 0.88, and they used a Kaplan-Meier. So what happened here? Published in a very prestigious journal, I might add. But we'll try to slightly protect the innocent, or not so innocent. So they collected the data, lots and lots of information. Part of this information is presence or absence of ascites. So one important thing to remember is ascites, if you have it, is indicative that you have worse disease. They also have prothrombin time and some other elements. Now, when we put prothrombin time into this model the way they did it, which was right, they subtracted 10 seconds. So when this X of P is zero, that means I have a prothrombin time of 10 seconds. So they have elements. So they wrote this, Cox, you can write the Cox model, and so they have this variable for treatment and variable for ascites. So here we have it. 
you've got, here's my full model. This X is going to be 1 if they're on my new drug, 0 if they're on placebo. The X of A is going to be 1 if you have ascites, 0 if you don't. This is at baseline, I should say, baseline ascites. And X of P will be 0 if you have prothrombin time of 10, but it's basically your prothrombin time in seconds. And this lets me interpret the baseline hazard. So the baseline hazard is the event rate at time t in the placebo arm, so when x is 0 here, for subjects without ascites, so when that x is 0, and the prothrombin time of 10 seconds when the other x is 0. So what is the relative rate of death two years post-randomization for a subject on the trial who received the new treatment so that will be my treatment equal 1. Had ascites at randomization, x of a equal to 1. And a prothrombin time of 10 seconds, x of p equals 0, compared to a similar subject who only received placebo. Whenever you see this type of thing, similar subject means the only thing different is what they just listed. So I'm basically only looking at this variable. The ascites and the prothrombin time are the same. And when you calculate this, the next slide has the math. I'm not going to go through it. Your relative rate of death was 0.087. There's your math. If I believe proportional hazards, if somebody says, OK, not two years, Johnson. I want three years, relative rate is the same. But the nice thing here, and all the doctors, you see those apps where they're trying to give you your personalized information? It's a big old lookup table from an algorithm like that. I can work out the relative rates for lots of subject comparisons. But the problem with this study is that the physicians were reluctant to enter patients with ascites on the trial because they were afraid of toxicity. So after about a year and a half, recruitment is going OK, and you start to see it become representative of the clinical population. The problem was what they published was Kaplan-Meier curves. So the censoring was not independent of the ascites. At those larger time points, those risk sets did not include patients with ascites because they were not recruited early enough to get to the later time points. They were not followed long enough to even have information. So the hazard function was biased small, and the survival function was biased also. So how do I work this out? Think about the first participant entered until the end of study is four years. I'm enrolling for three years. So most people could be on this study for at least one year or up to four years if I follow them enrollment to end of study. If I don't start fully enrolling ascites for a year and a half, they can only be on study for one year, up to two and a half years. I don't have the full proportional population risk set information after two and a half years. Ascites has a worse prognosis. So all these estimates I have are way too high or tall, small. The main thing, they're wrong. So is it all doom and gloom? No cox flies in and saves the day. No bias as long as I have that ascites variable in my model, which I now do. Censoring will be independent given ascites. The censoring is independent. That's what you need for consistency of the partial likelihood estimator for my statisticians, the coefficients for everybody else. That missed trial, if you decide to read it, three management methods for early miscarriage. Like I said, the initial outcome was gynecologic infections. The effective management method on subsequent fertility was what they were trying to look at, however, in the rest of the study. The intervention they were randomized, evacuation retained products, watch and wait, or medical management, they actually did two analyses, as was brought up when Paul talked about per protocol or intent to treat. They did one with what they were randomized to, but especially if you treat women, many times you know that sometimes you have to do something else. And so they were also did another one that included what women actually received. They did this by a survey. There are a lot of things that aren't great about this analysis about the article, but I think it gives you a nice idea 
where they did both the Kaplan Meyer and the Cox. And so they talk about the differences. And because there are variables, they said, okay, how old were they? What, what determines that you might have a live birth? How old you are, if you've had a live birth before, if you've had lots of miscarriages, or this was your first one. There are lots of variables that needed to go in that could have been driving the time to that live birth. So a few conclusions, and then we'll go to break. Y'all have been very quiet this morning. It's a scary topic, I gotta tell you. But are you doing okay? Are we doing okay? All right. So survive, <laughs> they're like, no, not at all. Eh, okay. Here's your conclusion. This is everything you need to know about survival analysis and 10 slides. I talk for an hour and a half, 10 slides will be done. Survival is about inference on event rates. So focus on that. Survival is about drawing inference about event rates. That rate, you want to be the rate among people who are at risk at time t. You will be looking at median survival, not mean survival. Cox regression is your most robust method. Kaplan-Meier curves do not have sensible interpretations for competing risks. That will answer a lot of questions right there. Survival analysis can handle, in general, right censoring and left truncation. If you use the correct form of survival analysis, it will handle recurrent events and competing risks but you need to have available the representative risk set at a given time point to allow us to estimate or model those event rates. What do you need to know about Kaplan-Meier in one slide? It is a nice way to estimate survival. It is simple. You can compute it by hand. I will not make you do it, but you can compute it by hand. You can add stratification factors, but you cannot evaluate covariates like you can in the Cox model. And there is no sensible interpretation for competing risks. Log rank is a way that you can do inference drawing off the information from that Kaplan-Meier. Those log rank statistics compare event rates and allow for the same generality for right censoring and left truncation, but nothing else. And what's not on here but should be is, and you only get a p-value, that's it. So no competing risks, no recurrent events, no time-dependent covariates. Cox models for your event rates provide a framework for making inference about all those covariate effects that could be taken into account. So you get more than a p-value. You get lots of numbers. It is multiplicative. That effect to the covariate is going to be multiplying the rate by a factor. Cox models require one of two things, typically. Either you have a constant rate over time, so you have proportional hazards, or you have non-proportional hazards and you have to model that rate over time. So it's gonna be one of two, but there is a way to do it either way. You can have time-dependent covariates. You can also have stratification factors if you want. Truncation and censoring. Truncation and censoring independence is key. Truncation is about entering the study. Right truncation is an issue if you deal with registry data because the event has occurred, but you may not pick up all of the events. Left truncation is an issue because someone had the event, but they fall out of view before you can ever count them. So this is all about who didn't get into your study that you wish had. Censoring is about leaving the study. Right censoring is very common. These are the folks that you don't have complete follow-up on. Left censoring means your observation time is actually greater than your survival time, even though that's not the way you intended to do it. 
But always remember, your question comes first. But I hope I've given you some examples that if you don't keep your statistician involved in all of these elements and all of your thoughts and all the things that are going wrong or could go wrong or don't seem like they're going wrong, but the statistician may die of a heart attack when they hear about it, these are the things that why you want them at all your meetings and journal clubs and to talk to them over coffee to keep them involved in your work and your thinking. So we'll take questions now. If you have specific examples, please email me because a lot of these examples have come from course participants. And if you also have any suggestions for us to improve the course, we're going to probably talk next week and figure out how to do this better next time. So email me and let me know. So thank you very much.